Do you have your shot glass? We have to get into the right frame of mind for this. (laughs) (sighs) Hey, welcome everybody. Sustainability and supply chains impact on it are such an incredibly important topic these days. If you follow uh, my next guest on LinkedIn, uh, you can't miss the initiatives that he and his company have to, to really contribute with action in, in terms of uh, creating sustainability in all of their practices. Look, waste, I've seen it. Waste, carbon footprint, packaging, returns liquidation, all of these things are causing increasing damage to the environment. And we need companies that are, and people who are looking to solve this problem. So today, my guest and I will show you how carriers and logistics and supply chain service companies can provide impact, positive impact on the environment. And we're going to show you by way of example. So by the end of this episode, you'll not not only know what's being done today, but also what you can do right now and what's planned for the future to increase sustainability in the supply chain. Now, let's bring in our guest. My friend, Peter Stangeland, Chief Commercial Officer, D.B. Schenker, Norway. Peter has made tackling sustainability a big portion of his charge. He's in charge of sales and marketing for the company in that marketplace. And they've received a ton of accolades, D.B. Schenker, for their sustainability initiatives in the Nordics and continental Europe. So I don't even know where he is. Peter joins us from somewhere across the pond. He's always safely, of course on the move. So let's have him share his current spot and tell us a little bit about what he's doing. So thanks for joining us, Peter. Where in the world are you? Thanks, Greg. Uh, I'm actually situated in in Oslo, Norway, one of the best countries in the whole wide world. And we (laughs) are some hours apart. (laughs) Not that you're biased, right? (laughs) No, 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 no. I'm I'm quite biased too. I'm a huge fan of Norway and particularly of Oslo. But you're actually at your home right now, which I feel like yeah. could be a little bit lonely because you don't you've been sort of uh, moving around, right? It, since you yeah. can work from anywhere, you do. We haven't been able, as you know, we haven't in Norway or in many other countries been able to work at the office. So we have been working from home uh, the last year, but uh, we have been fortunate so we can alternate between our cabin and home apartment so we can have a mix. And uh, of course, the wife is uh, addressing that we need to be not at home the whole day (laughs) or whole week because she's usually also traveling quite a bit. So she, her preferred location is at the cabin where she can go skiing and mountain biking or swimming or whatever. Right. So, yeah. And you are half of what I like to call a supply chain power couple, right? Lorna Stangeland, <laughs> your wife, um, is a big time. I don't want to give away all of that because we'll probably have her on a show shortly, but uh you think she'll do a show with us? I don't know. Oh, uh, she might do one. I have to <laughs> have to give her some tequila first, and I'll, I'll persuade her. <laughs> there we go. Uh, but you're both. You have kind of come into supply chain by way of the companies that you've worked with, and yeah. of course, and of course, Lorna runs supply chain. Has run supply chain at a couple companies there in Norway as well, right? Yeah, she has run uh, supply chain companies for the last, I'd say, 20, 25 years. Three PL or actually four PL logistics. Uh, and on my side, I've been came from a degree with transport economics and logistics, and started working within logistics the last, uh, I would say, 25 years also with the military first and logistics oh. also military. So it has been a good, what's it called? A good red thread through my history also. Right. Well, and, and uh, military service is mandatory in Norway, correct? Yeah, you, you can, it's mandatory for, let's say, as a, a normal soldier, or you can go to a officer's training school, which is two years of uh, train, uh, one year of training and one year of practical training, okay. where, you, uh, where you start as a sergeant, and then you can continue doing that and go to another officer's training where you can be captain or major and just start the ladder. 
Ah, uh, so that if you go to OCS, it's probably much like here in the states. You get out of the hard work, yeah, right. <laughs> you just direct right. people. <laughs> <laughs> you direct people how to do things. So that that's an interesting discussion. Not to get too far off topic, but it's interesting. I was just having a discussion with some U.S. military vets, and I'm curious your perspective on this particular point. What they've found is that. Some of the logistics companies uh, or supply chain generally companies that they have applied to, they don't see the connection between military logistics and manufacturing or physical goods or, uh, or, or finished goods logistics. What are they missing there? It seems like there's, there is a logical connection. So what do you, what's your take on that? That's uh, that's a strange question because here in, in on the other side of the pond, military education and military experience is highly valued in, in in the civilian companies, mm-hmm. and and it's sought after. Um, it's difficult to to, to say, but uh, they probably don't have the, enough insight in what kind of logistics operations that are done and being planned. It's not easy to move a battalion from A to B across the world uh, without uh, knowing something or planning something a month up ahead. Yeah. It, with, it, with ships, with planes, with trains. And when it comes to an harbor, you have to do any permits you needed from A to B after, the, from the harbor to the, where the battalion is gonna be placed. It, it's difficult. I'm not sure what what the challenge is uh, yeah, about that. It, it seems instinct, instinctive that it would be very closely related, or at least you could find some relation between those things, right? I, I think of it this way. This this is my thought around military: mm-hmm. is military people have to make they have to make instantaneous life or death decisions with inadequate information very often, yep. right? And to me, considering particularly some of the some of the disruptions we've faced in the last year or so, it seems like that's a perfect set of training for supply chain these days. Yeah, I'm not sure why supply chain is not uh, from the military side is evaluated uh, like a great asset. But um, well, I think it is for some companies. It's just having heard that, it's hard for me to believe that any company would not be able to bridge the gap, right? Is there something? Yeah, because, yeah, there- here you have a staff which is well-trained, uh, well-mannered, right. uh, good insight in what and how and why. You, you, all of these things you're trained for. Yeah. Only thing you, you don't know when you train is how and when you're actually going to use it, but you're prepared for anything. Right. And, right, and and, uh, and you have to act on a moment's notice because off it's not like the military is telegraphing what's going to happen, right? They no, can't it's not the do that. smoke signals anymore. No. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, so let's shift gears a little bit because I am. Um, I, I mean, I know you have the sales and marketing experience and uh, and and responsibility for Norway, but I I feel like sustainability is such a big part of that, and what's truly impressive about what I've seen. And, you know, I've been connected with you for a while, but what I've seen is, is that what DB Shanker is doing and and what you're involved in is it's important and impactful action. It's not a paper commitment. You don't have, of course you do, I'm sure have the commitment to be carbon neutral by X date or whatever, but you can actually virtually every day see what you all are doing to move towards that. You've got, yeah. uh, you know, what immediately comes to mind is you've got, you've got battery uh, uh, electric EVs, right? Doing some of your deliveries around town. You've got those cool little bicycle that are last mi- mile delivery um, yeah. vehicles. Um, so there's clearly a commitment and yet, it, and it's demonstrated with initiative after initiative. So, I want to broaden that. Having said that, I want to broaden that a little bit bigger. So I've been to Norway a a few times, as you know, uh, my second favorite country on the planet. And and sustainability has always been in the forefront of Norway. And, um, you know, they're some of the biggest purchasers by capita of electronic vehicles. People use scooters. They've used electrics for why. Why do you think 
that the Nordics has so readily embraced sustainability? Greg, I think from a Nordic perspective, uh, the sustainability focus came in very early because all our, um, all our income in Norway, Sweden, uh, Finland, and, uh, and uh, Norway, in that sake, are based on what Mother Nature gives us. Uh, it's uh, either water power, wind power, oil, gas, fish, forestry. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, we are seeing closely very often uh, what um, the, uh, the challenges of nature is with uh, changes in nature, ice melting, and so forth. Mm-hmm. Uh, and what, as you mentioned, uh, the governments have had our eyes on uh, this changes in nature for a long time. And uh, they have also understood that we need to stop or delay the changes in, in the nature. So um, with the creation uh, creation of focus on sustainability, it has come to help our next, let's say, grandchildren to, mm-hmm. to even have a great place to, to live in. As you know, as you guys might know, is also that the Nordic countries by themselves are quite small. So the path from political talks to actions are quite short and fast if the politicians want to. And in this case, they have wanted to, to, yeah. to be a, a, a part of the change and the solution. So the, the government, in the, especially in Norway, have put in a lot of, let's say, lower taxes or taken away taxes, especially on electric vehicles. The country buying the most Teslas for the last X number of years have, have been Norway. And that's based on no taxes on, on, uh, on, on the Tesla. It doesn't matter what model. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, think, I think that's a really good uh, call. There's a couple of great call outs there. One, um, your, your country has the population of some of the smaller states in the U.S., right? I think your population is about the same. Uh, it's about 4.4 million. Is that right? Oh, it's closer to five now. Yeah. Is it? Okay. Okay. So that, uh, so that makes you about the size of, and not, not that makes you about the size of Alabama in the States yeah. in terms of population. So you're right. That cr- creates a lot of efficiency. Um, I mean, I, I've stayed in Oslo. I've stayed near the state house and, and the palace and, um, you know, and it, it's all very, very proximate there. If you want to go talk to someone in government, you could literally knock on a door and do that. You could, yeah, you can. Yeah. Right. Um, and, and I think, I, I, and as you stated, I think it's interesting, as you can imagine, like so many of us, I'm wa- watching all of the sort of Vikings shows on, on, <laughs> That's um, why I have the beard yeah. on Netflix, right? Well, and I attempted it. I did attempt it. Oh yeah, that's, yeah. that's as good yeah. as I got right there. Not bad, not bad. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but you know, you can see that in the history of the Danes and the Norwegians, particularly, that they were seeking places to be able to plant and grow more than more than anything else, really. Um, so you are in the forefront. I had not really thought about it that perspective. You are in the forefront of nature. And there's a little bit of irony because a lot of your GDP comes from fossil fuels, right? Comes from oil. We are pumping a lot of oil and a lot of gas out of the Northern Sea. And that's actually what's making Norway one of the richest countries in the world. Right. Uh, and if you, if you see the irony in that, that we are funding a lot of the other countries in the world with oil and gas, we have taken this next leap to be self-sufficient with the wind power or so solar power right to not be able to there is a target from the government to not have fossil fuel cars in norway within some years yeah and even based on that that's how we're funding our uh, democratic socialism that that it's 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 an interesting perspective to have yeah the only beef i have with norway is <clears throat> they stopped selling beer at eight, eight o'clock in the stores. <laughs> in the so, stores. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I remember if being... If you have a good supply chain up front, Greg, then yeah, you'll be heavily supplied. Yeah. The store was completely stocked with beer. 
it was just a, it was at 805 in, on Tuve Holman where I was staying in an Airbnb that I realized I was already too late. So I had to take my you box of cereal late. and my jug of milk back up to my room and <laughs> like here now that. when it's uh, bank holidays in Norway, you, you can't even buy anything or alcohol then in the stores either. Yeah. Yep. That, that's similar in the States. And of course it's state by state here, but it's very similar here. So you have to plan ahead. Right. And I think that probably lends by the way, to your ability in terms of logistics, excellent is having to plan ahead for things like that. Yep. So let's talk a little bit about, about you and about DB Shanker and, and your sustainability initiatives. So tell us about your team, your, your role relative to, to, um, to sustainability and why you, you know, tell us a little bit about your enthusiasm around that as well. Yeah, sure. Uh, as the chief commercial officer for DB Schenke Norway, my main goal is, uh, or objective of the day is sales and marketing. And we discussed in the management team back in uh, 2017, 2018, that we wanted to be make to make a difference, to be a front runner, as you said, within sustainability in the Norwegian market, because we we had seen what the government were, were looking for and we thought we were aiming for the what's the position we can be take as a front runner within the sustainability in the market um, within sales it's it's a positive thing to have something that the other competition doesn't have and yeah. and, 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 mm. and then leading the sales team in norway was it was, let's say, it's it's been a good pleasure for us to have the the example of sustainability actions, and and the focus we had from ourselves, our achievements, and not at least the the uh, election that we were election elected, the European ambassador for the European Green Capital in Oslo in 2019. Wow, nothing we paid for. Uh, it, it was uh, an, an achievement and, and, and a phone call I got uh, after we introduced the, the electric bikes, as you mentioned, electric cargo bikes in 2018. And the, the municipality of Oslo, they saw how we were working and our, let's say, and they were, they were involved in our future plans. Uh, for making the world's first emission-free distribution center in Oslo. Mm. And uh, in 2018, Oslo was the European green capital of Europe elected by the European Union. And they had three big ambassadors. And one of them was us. The biggest CO2 player in Norway was elected an ambassador, which made us very proud. And at least uh, we all were proud. And I was fortunate also to be an ambassador myself, to be a part of different um, congresses and team members or team meetings so we could discuss sustainability on a bigger scale with bigger companies and smaller companies. They even started the carpenter, uh, carpenter companies in Oslo in 2019, which don't use any trucks anymore. They only use cargo bikes. So really? The, yeah. <laughs> so the steps have been been uh, huge. So how do you carry it? How do you carry lumber to your job site on your cargo bike? I'm curious about. <laughs> Stack them up high, <laughs> <laughs> or and, and or take them on the long. On, let's say you you stack them long because you don't you you're not building new houses. You're yeah. remodeling houses yeah. or apartments in 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 the city. Well, and it, I mean, Oslo has no shortage of 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 uh traffic constrictions and that sort of thing i mean i've i've driven in oslo right so i try never to but i have and um th there are so many physical barriers in oslo mountains and fjords and 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 shoreline and whatnot so um i could see where you where companies have have adapted and and in fact um you guys have used some quite interesting techniques for building i mean they've repurposed old containers for buildings in parts of yeah, oslo they, they, 
The new distribution center in Oslo, the Oslo City Hub, is uh, built of 40-foot containers, yeah. old UC containers that was put together like the game of Tetris. Yes. Yeah. And it was built and opened uh, in May 2019. Uh, we have had press and visits from over 40, 50 countries during 2019. Even the, the transport authorities in New York has been there to see what we have done in little Norway. Um, but since we made it, uh, opened it in May, uh, in May uh, 19, we have doubled the size since because we have now introduced 100% emission-free distribution in Oslo wow. as the first capital in the world. Uh, Schenk, DB Schenker is delivering emission-free to all customers, all kinds in, in Oslo now in 2021. So we are very proud of that. That's, that's an incredible accomplishment because that not only goes to the, de to the delivery vehicles, but also how you produce and consume power in, in the distribution center, correct? Yeah. This whole, this whole sustainability part from our uh, side was a management decision, which was bold. Uh, we plan to have, we wanted to be 100% uh, emission-free in a city by city and take city for city. We experienced first that the electric cargo bikes was the way to start because as you mentioned, Greg, traveling in, in bigger cities with congestion, it's, uh, it's difficult to have a delivery van. Yeah. These cargo bikes, they can go on the sidewalks and go down all areas where you can't park a car. You don't have to look for parking. You have to pay for parking. You can just drive your bike to the shop or store and, or the apartment and deliver the goods there. So after we got uh, many of these bikes, we also needed some electric vans. So we bought some uh, MAN TGE vans in 2019. Right. We bought yeah. eight of them first in Oslo. And then in 2020, when we doubled it, uh, the, the Oslo City Hub, we doubled the size in, uh, in uh, also May 2020. We also had the orders for the first Volvo electric trucks in, in the world. Uh, so we, we received in the fall in 2020, uh, the three first electric uh, full city distribution trucks from Volvo. And uh, it was actually the ribbons were cut off by our prime minister in Norway. Right. And, and uh, our company's global CEO, Jochen Teves. So that was a great day for us. So clearly you, um, you take a lot of pride in that because I recall when you posted about that, right? You were giddy, frankly, about it. I mean, it was, it was, it was clearly you were having fun with it, um, really yeah. obviously proud for your company, but I think just generally proud about this, these sustainability initiatives. So what, I mean, what kind of, I mean, were you brought up this way? I mean, did your parents introduce you to this? Was it kind of the gradual... Oh, I think um, I, I was brought up in a car family. My family uh, owned a car dealership, so uh, <laughs> perhaps I've seen too much emission. Well, I, I mean, needed to change. You're no, rebelling I, I, against your roots, rebelling. aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think the the, uh, the change for me has been that to see that uh, we are in the position that our our acts actually have a. a, a our acts actually makes a difference. Mm -hmm. And as a manager in a company, you are able to set a, a target, a stretch target that can change um, and help for the future for the, our kids. That's... And, uh, and uh, to, to be able to be working for a company that has such a high focus on sustainability and invests in sustainability and to see actually how that makes my girl, baby girl on 12, proud to see that the company is actually doing something and it's noticed in the media and it's the whole, her whole class knows that uh, what company her father works for because they're working with sustainability and putting environmental focus on, on the agenda. That's outstanding. What a great example for your kids. Right. To be able to do that. And I think to see your parents contribute to that has, is, of course, encouraging to her. But 
Um, just such an, a great example. So much of that is learned at home, right? Uh, or it has to be relearned outside the home. So, um, you know, just, the, I'm, I'm just impressed by watching you do that, watching you report on that. Yes. Clear, clearly, it's, it's as much about the sustainability aspect of it as it is about promoting D.B. Shanker. I mean, and and I think that's an important aspect of it because you clearly take a lot of joy in, in what you guys are doing. Yep. Um, and D.B. Shanker, I, I mean, I think you all are, you're performing above and beyond the legal requirements, right? This is, your initiatives are well above what's required by the it's government. It's above correct? and beyond, yeah. Uh, especially if for, for Norway, D.B. Schenker globally has been using Norway as a front runner and a test area for what is possible. And uh, as we uh, are active then here representing Norway, the municipality in, in, uh, in Oslo have been putting a lot of higher and higher demands on the procurement of pens and paper. And how are these pens and paper delivered to all the municipality office all around the city? Hmm. Uh, so uh, if you're doing medical supplies, uh, furniture, how are the, all of these things delivered to our offices? And when the municipality comes in and put in in a procurement situation, all your goods have to have to be delivered 100% emission free. Wow. That's the way to, to reach a higher, let's say, carbon neutral place for our cities in the future. There has to be a demand. Uh, and uh, and it has to be a demand. And at, at today's situation is that the, the challenge is to get enough emission-free vehicles mm. because uh, they're yeah. not produced enough. All the uh, on the electric side, all the power, all the investments by the car manufacturers are going to the uh, our your car or my car, and not on the distribution side on bigger goods. So Volvo and Scania are now doing, and Mon are doing a lot more now, but they, they, are, they are five, 10 years behind in capacity, wow. not in the solution, but in capacity. And that, that, makes, that makes your initiative with the bikes that much more important, right? I mean, obviously you can't, you can't haul semi-sized goods no. with those things, but being able to to kind of handle the last mile and work your way back, it, at least you're you're doing what you can you can. In all terms all of we are capacity. doing in Oslo, uh, or all we have been doing in Oslo, is cities uh, hub is uh, the last mile deliveries. And now that we have been um, able to get more and more electric vans and trucks, we are now um, taking this to other cities in Norway as well. It's not Oslo is not finished but we are at the level we are very proud of and satisfied with and then we're taking it to the other cities in Oslo in, in Norway. So obviously the the seeking out of sustainability is not perfect and as you said it's not even we don't have the capacity to enable everything we want to do today but you are doing a lot and you have progressed significantly so share with us a little bit about what other companies can learn and how they how you've created success and, and are continuing to move forward in sustainability. And, and, you know, tell us a little bit about what, what, what you think is required in a company to sort of break through to enable a sustainability mindset and initiatives. I think, the, as I mentioned here earlier too, one of the biggest targets is to make a target which is not a paper target it's going to be an actual target that you will want to reach and preach to your staff you have to be showing them and uh, that we are actually meaning something with it does mm -hmm. it does it take a new resource does it need for you to hire some new people to put an extra focus on it to keep it uh, focus on the daily uh, on the daily basis do it but put targets which is probably not reachable within the first year or two but you have to have a stretch target that you perhaps might in a year have to move because you, uh, you move further ahead because you are developing too fast or faster than you expected because mm -hmm. you get your staff on board if you don't get your staff on board then then it's going to be tough and the only way the staff comes on board is that you have to show them 
by passion that you really mean it. We're in it for a long ride and not, not for a PR stunt in the media for two weeks. Deeds, not words, right? So yeah. d- did you all, do you all have sort of a, a tiger team or a, a focus team on sustainability? We have a team, a uh, sustainability team working uh, from, has, the, the team has been developed more in 2020. From the beginning, it was some people doing it next to their normal job. Yeah. But they did a heck of a job and a good, they got a very good result for us in the, really? the Diebeschinger land team in Norway. But now we have it. We need to be putting more structure in it. Now we're developing to more cities because this uh, Oslo City Hub is next to our biggest uh, terminal and headquarters in, in Oslo. So it was easier to, to, let's say, play with the resources. But now we're going to more and more cities. Then right. we, we need a structured approach and a structured team that is working on it dedicated every day. So basically, you've kind of built a franchise model. It seems like you, you've got this group of people with a playbook, right? You send them out to some of the literally hinterlands of, I'm yeah, assuming but, your but st- right, the, the challenge is that when we started, we didn't know where to go. Yeah. We just had a target. We, we didn't have a clue. clue and someone will beat me for that, that <laughs> sentence. Where, where and how we were, we were going. We wanted to be the best on sustainability in Norway. We wanted to be the front runner. That was our target. Yeah. How and why, or how and uh, how we will get there, we didn't know. But we managed to get there because we let the team have a widened a widen scope so, and they were able to do it. Now we're going to do more cities and then the structure, we know what we know what we have done and now we can build on what we have done and take the good, good stakes out and, and develop that further to a new system. Or perhaps it's the same, we don't know. But it's not too many cities where we get uh, a possibility to have a huge uh, distribution hub dead city center. Yeah. On Schuholmen. Yeah. It, oh, it is there. Wow. I, I think if people knew the sort of remoteness of that, they would understand. Tuve Holman used to be a prison, right? And now it's quite a posh um, resort area, yeah. correct? And, and there's a, there are actual, actually some physical barriers, a canal, because it's effectively an island. So I think they've it's closed the gap. It's a created island. What's that? Uh, it's a created island, and yeah. uh, if you remember, you saw saw some big passenger ships yeah. uh, going. Uh, they, that's where the, the the Oslo City Hub is uh, uh, placed. Outstanding. Very well, so. Help help some of our uh, community out there who hope to develop an initiative. I think you've given them some great takeaways here, but. What were some of the struggles or the learnings that you guys had that you think would be valuable to share with, with folks who listen to this? The struggles we had was um, uh, that first struggle was what are we going to do? Uh, do we have the equipment? Uh, do we, how are we going to set up a, a distribution center in, 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 Closer to, closer to, to let's say the recipients of the last mile because on when we started with the electric bikes, the, the distance they could travel every day couldn't be ex- or exceeded during the way, mm-hmm. and it, and um, I would say the biggest struggle was to 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 actually set the target. How how bold do you want to be? Yeah, that was our that was the biggest struggle because. Anyone can say, put a target that, oh, we didn't reach the target, but we want to have a bold target that we wanted to reach. We wanted to struggle for it. And uh, we, we made a home run because everyone was behind it, behind it and supporting it. That's classically Norwegian, isn't it, to want to struggle for something? I mean, I, I, <laughs> I wonder if, I, well, I mean, truly, I, I think culture comes comes significantly into these kind of initiatives. And I wonder if that 
Um, if, if other yeah. companies, ha they need to have that kind of level of commitment. They need to know that they're going to struggle. They need to accept that they're going to have some pain, some missteps, some delays, some disappointments. Greg, you, you, said, you said a word I should have mentioned, culture. Yes, it's a culture team. You have to create a culture that you want to be sustainable. You want to be a partner that others look up on and think, wow, we want to be like them. Yeah. And that's a culture part. You have to, all companies have a culture, even if there is good or bad or perfect or developing here <laughs> and there. But if you're going to, going to introduce something, a new way of thinking, a new way of working, then you have to change the culture. And if the company is not motivated to, to, to change for change their culture, then it's difficult. Yeah, it, it's, you're right. And, and as you said, culture, you either, you either have an intentional culture or you have an accidental culture. Either way, you have a culture. But cultures that are truly, truly productive, I've found, are very, very intentional, like you've described. Is there some place that folks can learn uh, more about what you all are, are doing? I just feel like the framework that you all have and the initiatives that you all undertake and the method by which you go after it would be really valuable. Is there a particular site or a playbook or something like that that you all share? Uh, we, we share on our uh, global websites and the national website for DB Schenker Norway. And I can also put out, give, send you an, uh, an, a link so you can. Yeah, the, we'll put that in the show the notes. Or uh, the text here. Okay, outstanding. Yeah, that'd be great. Well, so you've given us some great takeaways, I think. Is there anything in particular as kind of a last salvo that you would like people to take away from this or to know that as they tackle these uh, sustainability initiatives? Stop talking, act. <laughs> brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> that is brilliant. And it seems like you all did that. As you said, you didn't know exactly what you were going to do. You just knew you wanted to be best and yep. engaged the team, empowered the team, built it into the culture, and, and acted. Yep. Do something, even if you do it wrong, right? Well, we didn't do the same. We didn't do the uh, things right at the first time. As you mentioned also, it has, it has to be an option to fail. If you yeah. don't fail, you don't learn. And if we don't learn, we don't develop. And then if we don't develop, then we could lock the door and throw away the key it has to be room to fail outstanding look i want to i want people i want to share with my takeaways with folks and, and that is have a target and decide how bold you want that target to be as peter said right um real physical targets not paper not a plan real physical targets pick something that you want to do and work towards that. Engage and, in, and empower your team to be able to tackle those initiatives, build it into the culture, and then go do it. What was the last thing that you said? You said not talking. Those not talk talking. Act. Yeah. yeah. Very good. Um, well, thank you. I appreciate you joining us. Uh, where can folks connect with you? As if I don't know, but they may not. You can find my profile on LinkedIn and push connect or link. <laughs> there we go. I think it's a great idea. First of all, it's uplifting what you post around that. It's great to know that you are, I, I would argue, possibly in the forefront of the world, certainly in the forefront of Europe in terms of doing things and promoting and continuing to push forward in creating sustainability initiatives far above what is required. And I think that is incredibly commendable, commendable as well. Uh, thank you for joining us, Peter. I really, really appreciate it. Thanks, Greg, for having me.